Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool. Uh, we've got a few things to go over here before we jump into the rundown and then get to our fantastic guest, Edmund McMillan, who's going to join us and talk about the legend of Bumbo. Uh, first of all, today is the day that Blade Runner takes place, November 20th, 2019. That's uh, giving you guys all the date, just in case you forgot what day it is. How cool is that? Thankfully, we don't live in the world of Blade Runner. As cool as it was aesthetically, who wants to live like that, right? Um, also, um, our heartfelt condolences go out to everybody that worked with uh, Brad McQuaid, who uh, passed away yesterday. Um, it's uh, swirling around the video game industry. He was one of the, uh, the co-creators and co-designers of um, the EverQuest franchise and uh, has done a lot in the MMO space out there. I, I looked online to see if we had any, any interview clips with uh, Brad, um, couldn't find any. That's another big reason why we need to archive everything that we have. Um, but uh, yeah, our, our, our condolences to everybody that knew him. Very sad news, he was way too young. Um, and our respects especially to everybody that worked with him on uh, the wonderful EverQuest. Uh, all right, we've got a rundown to get to, and this one is going out to uh, Justin Naylor, who says, whoever thumbs down Vic is just sad in life, LOL. Well, you could thumbs down a video if you don't dig it, but uh, I, I tend to, to agree. If you thumbs me down, it's not cool. All right, let's get started with Justin Naylor's rundown. Apparently, all that talk about Joker being a standalone movie was all a big joke. Warner Brothers and writer-director Todd Phillips are reportedly working on a sequel to their blockbuster supervillain movie, and on top of that, Phillips may also be developing additional films that will explore the origins of other DC evildoers. The Hollywood Reporter claims that Phillips has inked the deal following an explosive box office success of Joker, which just became the first R-rated movie to earn more than a billion dollars at the box office, although other outlets are reporting that the deal has yet to be finalized, so it may not happen. No word yet on what other villains might appear in the future films, but if they do become a reality, and uh, there's also no word if any of these new movies might be brought into the fold of the larger DC cinematic universe, I would suspect that uh, Warner Brothers is scrambling right now to figure out how to get Todd Phillips in involved in as much as he possibly can be involved with. Uh, I think the aesthetic of Joker, I, I love the movie, by the way. I thought it was fantastic. It was just a great bit of filmmaking that was very challenging, very much in the mood of uh, classic, psychotic Joker stories. Um, and yes, it dealt with some really heavy stuff, but the Joker is a merciless killer, an insane, merciless killer that gets locked up in Arkham Asylum in the book. So... The, the characterization that Joaquin Phoenix put together with Todd Phillips was uh, in keeping, and I thought it was great. But I also like this uh, uh, this sort of, you, you know, uh, old school 80s kind of vibe, this New York City, this gritty, you know, tech-free world. And I think they could do some pretty interesting stuff with superheroes in that time frame, in that time period. And I would I, honestly, I would love to see a Batman in that time frame. I think it would be great. Um, I'm excited to see what's up next for Todd Phillips. I suspect that we are uh, going to be seeing him in the comic book universe for a while. And I also expect that we're probably going to be seeing some threading with uh, some of the other characters that he, he works with. But I, I imagine that he will tire quickly of being the villain guy. And he's going to want to interject some other types of uh, uh, viewpoints and perspectives. Um, and I think he's more than capable. He showed that he is. I'm very excited about that news. Now, it looks like the USS Enterprise is finally warping back into theaters. Paramount Pictures is moving forward with a new movie in the Star Trek franchise. According to The Hollywood Reporter, the studio has signed Fargo and Legion producer Noah Hawley to write and direct, with J.J. Abrams back in the producer's chair and stars Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, Zoe Saldana, and others back in their roles. This means that the new movie takes place in the same alternate timeline as the previous three films, which is separate from the continuity of Star Trek Discovery and the classic series. It's unclear what this means for the rumored Trek film in the works from Quentin Tarantino, 
Whoever makes the new movie, this will be the first Star Trek film produced since the reunification of distributors CBS and Paramount, meaning the rights to all the Trek characters, planets, and ship designs are under the same roof for the first time in years. And uh, I think that's pretty exciting news for Star Trek fans out there, although I'm not a huge fan of the uh, Abrams-produced second and third Trek movies. I felt like they deviated a little bit too much into the uh, Star Wars kind of vibe and the action-oriented vibe. I did like the first one, though, quite a bit. So hopefully uh, Noah Hawley, who has proven himself to be a a very, very crafty and intelligent creator, is going to uh, refashion this new vision of Trek, you know, closer to the Gene Roddenberry era or the Star Trek Next Generation era. And clearly what's probably going to happen here is that Star Trek, uh, as a a movie franchise, is going to morph into uh, some kind of a streaming universe as well for CBS All Access. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of these characters, if not all of these characters, end up on, um, you know, either spinoff shows or a whole new uh, Star Trek series, Uh, because I think the streaming audience is is just going to get bigger and bigger and that's where you know uh, CBS and Paramount are probably going to make a lot more money and clearly they, they, if they build the inventory around the Trek movies those can uh, be a part of the vault of stuff that's going to be on the CBS All Access app um, and uh, get people to subscribe to that uh, so you know fingers crossed that we get a great fourth Trek flick All right, now the Saints are about to come marching back into the gaming world. A new Saints Row game is in the works and will be officially unveiled next year. That's according to publisher THQ Nordic, who tells investors that developer Volition Inc. has been hard at work on the new game and are deep in development, so they plan to finally start showing off what they've been working on in 2020. That's all we know for now. The Saints Row series has been dormant since Gat Out of Hell was released in 2015. THQ Nordic acquired the rights to the franchise when they bought Volition and former publisher Deep Silver last year. I like those Saints Row games. They're insane, um, and they have lots of fun gameplay. And they uh, also—it's almost like they are a parody of the parodies that the Grand Theft Auto series creates. You know, it's nice to have a— uh, kind of a mirror reflection to whatever Rockstar is working on. Um, and they've gone in some crazy super heroic directions in the past with uh, lots of insane abilities with the characters. Uh, this this could be a lot of fun, especially with the next-gen hardware that the, uh, the, the developers at Volition are going to be working on, um, hopefully flexing their muscles and showing off what uh, they could do, not just um, uh, creatively, but with, uh, you know, the beautiful visuals to, to match that kind of imagination. Uh, excited about this. I hope it delivers. I hope it's really fun. Uh, Now, the other big video game news that's out there right now is Jeff Keighley uh, has announced the uh, nominees for this year's Game Awards, Um, and we've got uh, six uh, nominees for the Game of the Year, which are Control, Death Stranding, Resident Evil 2, Sekiro, and and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, which came out too late to be included in last year's uh, awards, and then The Outer Worlds, um, I'm okay with Control and the Outer Worlds being in there. I'm too soon into Death Stranding to see if that is a, uh, a true worthy Game of the Year contender. I like Sekiro, and I love Resident Evil 2, although RE2 feels very, you know, it's a remake, right? So it feels a little weird to say this is the Game of the Year in 2019. Uh, it's also weird to be talking about Super Smash Bros. Ultimate as Nintendo's offering this year, although it is phenomenal. Um, when Nintendo has had arguably its strongest year ever as a publisher, its first party lineup has been insane this year. And it's sad that we don't see games like Luigi's Mansion uh, 3 or uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses on this list. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see. They're, they're in other categories, but in terms of game of the year, there's some awesome titles in uh, Nintendo's catalog and also some other forgotten games that uh, I think are, are worthy in this category as well. No doubt this will give us lots of uh, uh, d- discussion when the awards air next month, but also in our own lead up to the Rocket and Reagan Awards. Uh, an interesting side note about the Game Awards is that there are six uh, awards dedicated to esports, almost as many awards for esports as the traditional awards for the video game stuff that's out there. Nothing wrong with the attention that esports brings to the video game industry, but it does feel a little bit like um, Jeff and his team are kludging together the ESPYs and the Oscars for games, and it just feels a little incongruous. It's almost like somebody needs to make their own 
esports awards and leave the game awards to the people that build the games. It's my thought. Still, the show has been getting better and better every year, and uh, hats off to Jeff for uh, taking the reins and uh, trying to make a, a more entertaining and inclusive uh, you know, piece of entertainment every single year. And this year, they've partnered with uh, movie theaters across North America, so people are going to be able to go, go to movie theaters and watch the whole show live that way, which is pretty cool. Uh, and no doubt there's going to be uh, lots of great you know, on uh, presenters and, uh, and uh, musical guests and things like that. So super psyched to see what happens with the Game Awards. All right, you guys, that's going to do it for our rundown. Now let's take a look back at this day in everything cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for November 20th. On this day in 1985, Microsoft opened the window on a whole new era of computing. The very first version of Windows, known as Windows 1.0, was released, becoming the world's first mass-produced graphical user interface for personal computers. Before that, users could only interact with their computers by using text-based inputs like DOS, so having everything laid out for you visually on the screen was much easier and user-friendly. Microsoft didn't invent the idea of Windows. Apple beat them to it by having a Windows-based interface on their Lisa computer and original Macintosh, which had launched a year earlier, and both Apple and Microsoft stole or borrowed the Windows idea from another company, Xerox. Microsoft had even worked with Apple to develop applications for the Macintosh, which is how they got an early look at what Apple was doing. We're planning that over half of our retail sales next year will come from, from Macintosh software. Naturally, this didn't sit well with Apple when they found out that Microsoft had been developing their own Windows-based operating system the whole time. The thing that made Microsoft Windows different was that it could be bought separately and installed on different machines, while Apple software was only made to work with Apple hardware. Windows 1.0 was a massive success, and as new versions followed, Windows eventually became the default operating system for pretty much every personal computer on the market. This propelled Microsoft to the top of the tech industry and made a billionaire out of co-founder Bill Gates. All right, we are back, and I'm just connecting with our uh, guest today, Edward Edward McMillan. Uh, just making sure that we've got him. There we go. All right, there you go. How are you doing, Edward? I'm I'm good. You can see me okay. Yep, can see you just fine. All right, Edward McMillan is joining us today. He is the uh, co-creator of The Legend of Bumbo and Super Meat Boy and uh, a lot of fantastic uh, indie titles that you have played, uh, The Binding of Isaac, over the years. We have a lot to catch up with uh, with Edmund about. And uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about, though, is uh, you just released a brand new game called The Legend of Bumbo last week. What is The Legend of Bumbo? The Legend of Bumbo is a a randomly generated deck building puzzle game prequel to The Binding of Isaac. <laughs> so it's when nothing you... it's nothing like it, but it's also very similar. You wanted to build something in the universe of The Binding of Isaac? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I initially wanted to just build um I wanted to tr take a stab at making a casual game without making compromises that casual games usually make. Yep. Um and uh started out there and um, then Bumbo, I mean, originally it was going to be a game about hobos fighting each other over trash. Um, and I thought, wait, I have a hobo character in the Binding of Isaac. Let's just do that. And then after that, it was just like, okay, well, let's, uh, let's expand on what happened before the Binding of Isaac. I could, I could, people have a lot of questions. I don't give them a lot of answers, but, um, there's enough there. There's enough there to paint a nice picture of what Isaac's life was like before. That's amazing. You, you, you come up with indelible characters and, and uh, imagery, and it's very personal, the work that you craft and, and come up with. Was it the same process to, uh, to draw out the creative elements of The Legend of Bumbo as it was for The Binding of Isaac, or was it a, was it a different kind of routine for you this time? It was, it was different in a way. Um, I usually, depending on who I'm working with, I worked with James Interactive um, on this, who mm -hmm. um, had mo done most of my trailers. He's a video artist as well as a programmer and an artist in general. Great. Um, and uh, what I usually do when working with a, a programmer is I try to find something that we line up with, like some, some, some sort of overlap when it comes to things that we have in common. And I focus on the thing we have in common as the foundation of whatever I'm going to work on. Um, uh, and with, with James, we both shared a similar childhood. Yeah. We we're both poor creative kids who were, you know, isolated and lonely and tend to, uh, make a lot of cardboard dioramas and 
you know, just hang out by themselves, uh, making art and, and just living in an imaginary world. And I th thought that was like the most appropriate thing to focus on since it was our childhoods were strangely similar. Um, and I thought, OK, well, I can dive back into my childhood, but I can I can work with what we have in common and, and we can build out from there. And what we build out, what we literally built out of was a cardboard box. Um, and that's where the foundation of Bumbo's visuals and a lot of the themes and how it ties into Isaac all kind of came from for the most part. That's very cool. Yeah, the art looks a little bit like your, um, you've got like your own little puppet theater. Did you? And I'm curious if you, if you guys started with cutouts and, and uh, sort of shot video of what you were looking for and then made the 3D art to sort of represent it. Yeah, it was actually the other way around. A lot of people, because in the, in the trailers that I, that I actually did for the game, I did build out the whole game in real life, but it was it was never that way. Um, James did scan in all the cardboard a assets that we needed and paper assets, so it's all like real paper and cardboard, and he had to age some of it in the sun to make it look more genuine and stuff like that. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, the originally we were thinking about doing marionette, 3D marionette puppets. Yep. Um, and then it it was like, wait, no, like it makes more sense. It, when you finish the game, it makes perfect sense on why we did what we did, but I don't want to spoil too much. Yes, yes. Uh, now, this is a game where you can defeat the boss and then you basically start over again. It's like Binding of Isaac, right? Like yeah. this is a multiple playthrough game where you're sort of peeling off the onion layers. Yeah, for sure. The is game unfolds the more you play and the more time you put in, the game also gets more difficult. It, not, it knows where you're at and it scales up difficulty so the replays are more, you know, fun. That's terrific. When you're crafting a game like that how do you um how do you know how to balance how much you give the player on the first playthrough and and the second playthrough and the, like is it just through playing it over and over and over again or have you done yeah that? there's there's no better way to do it um yeah. you watch people play and you hear where they complain you hear where they make mistakes you, you just watch them like when in, when i play test with people i'll literally set somebody down and and just say go for it and they'll be like they'll start asking me questions or giving me suggestions it's like just let me I'll get more information watching you in your face and you, as you play the game than anything else. And I can see where people get hung up, where they get frustrated, where they feel dumb, where they feel smart. Um, and you just you tweak and tune, you know? Um, and that's usually where, where, where we end up. Like, it takes a lot of playthroughs. Like, even now, like, having thousands of people, I mean, close to 100,000 people at this point uh, playing the game, um, you get a lot of feedback and stuff I didn't realize. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's nice to be able to, especially on Steam, edit the game and improve the game and balance the game. And uh, that's what we're actively doing right now, for sure. Are you, are you a big fan of casual games and, and uh, you know, match threes and puzzle games and stuff like that? Or, or, or is this kind of like you uh, poking fun at, at that genre? I don't want to seem, like, mean about it, you know? But yeah. it's because I know that, like, Sometimes games are for certain people, you know, somebody wants to come home after a hard, hard days working or whatever, and they want to just relax and let a game essentially almost play itself. Um, yes. They're totally entitled to do that. And I understand why people do that. But for me, it's not my cup of tea. Yeah. Um, but I did appreciate I do appreciate a lot of the aspects of casual games that make them interesting because there is there's a lot of untapped potential there and people kind of throw them away because of, you know, they tend to be very manipulative and um, they tend to try to you know, squeeze money out of you and be free, free to play. And unless, yeah. you know, there's a lot of manipulative tactics and I just want to try to avoid all that, but still make an actually a, a fun, um, a game that sucks you in, in a respectful way, um, that rewards you for doing things that are smart and, and planning ahead and making like a turning something that's super basic that anybody can play into something that looks super basic and everybody can play, except some people can play it really, really, really well. <laughs> yeah. And it's you also know. a game where you can throw poo and snot at your enemies. Of course. Which makes it a very different puzzle type of experience than other games out there. I know where the market's going. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've got have, my pulse. On have the, you found yourself on, because uh, I certainly have, found, found myself on airplanes and just walked down the aisle and everybody's playing like uh, Candy Crush or something like that. I mean, I've been woken up in bed and I'm asking my wife what she's doing and she's playing Candy Crush. Like yeah. the, she went through that Candy Crush phase for sure. <laughs> I mean, I played, I played a few games. I think the, there was a PopCat game that I actually liked was Peggle. Oh, Peggle's um, amazing. 
which was super random but very relaxing. And I, yes. I can totally get into that game. I can totally get into that game. D dude, I visited Valve, you know, when they used to make games. It sounds like they're making games again. Uh, but they were <laughs> they were working on something, and I asked them uh, – uh, you know, what is, what is everybody playing? And everybody was playing Peggle. And they said, we're never going to be able to make a game better than Peggle. That's it. Peggle is the best thing ever. That's the I first time I'd ever heard fun. of it. And then, of course, I got addicted to it, too. Yeah, I played the hell out of it. And, uh, are you kind of hoping that that is um, what happens with The Legend of Bumbo, that this becomes this subversive uh, puzzle experience that introduces a whole new kind of person to the Ed, Edmund McMillan brand of game development? Well, I didn't think that at all. Like it all, it all spawned from, there was an aha moment where I gave my nephew a code. Yeah. He's young. He's, he's, I think he's 11 now yep. because he, he wanted to test and he, he, you know, I want to put him in the credits and everything else. So he's testing the game and I go over there and I see his dad is like backseat gaming him and telling him, you know, this is incorrect. You should be doing it like this. And finally he gives it up and lets him play it. His dad plays it for like an hour I notice his wife go over there. She starts backseat gaming him yeah. and she takes over and I leave. And of course it's your family. So you're thinking like, ah, oh, you know, they're just doing this for, cause I'm there, you know, just trying to make me feel better about what I'm working on. Yeah. But then I get a text and it's like, I found a bug. It's like, this is from Crystal. This is from my sister-in-law who doesn't play video games. She put like 30 or 40 hours into it before release. That's awesome. And then she bawled me out when it's like I, I didn't explain to her that usually when you when you're playing a test build, your save gets wiped before release. It's just usually how it works. Yes. Uh, and when I wiped her save, she's just like, I put in forty hours. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. Listen, I gotta but tell you, man. Like you, all over again. you sent me the code last week. You said, "Do you want a code for Legend of Bumbo?" And I, and I said, "Yes, please." But I, I I was in Japan and we just got back and I got back to. Uh, you know your game, but also the uh, the Jedi game and Death Stranding, and like, it's just been like boom. But I played it today, and I could feel its hooks getting into me. I could like, oh, this is this is super fun. And this, do you think you need to know, you know, a little bit about you or a little bit about Binding of Isaac to enjoy it and to, to appreciate what kind of a game it is? I don't know, not at all. I think it'll come off as really strange, but I think the mechanics will speak for themselves, and it'll be enjoyable and fun. Um, it's it's one of those it's one of those games, just like Isaac. That was a hard sell. It's it, yeah. trying to put this game out there and sell it to my audience. Like my audience sees that, and they're like, I don't want to play a casual game. Like I don't want to play some match game. And I'm trying to explain to them, well, it's not it's not just that that's just that's just how you move forward you know it's 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 like a, ch a game of chess like you're, yep. you're planning ahead and you got to get 10 steps ahead in order to win um but yeah I, I i don't know i didn't expect i didn't expect it to do as well as as it's done for sure yeah yep. it's weird to be working on a game where it i can see that it has the potential to be bigger than more my, my more niche you know weirdo game titles um, and I think a lot of people will go in not even knowing about the Binding of Isaac and end up playing this and being like, oh, well, why is this so strange? <laughs> well, let's talk about Isaac here for a second, because this has been the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, it's Super Meat Boy, I think, really made a name for you for you and for your colleagues. And, and uh, um, congratulations on the success of both of those. But Binding of Isaac is one of these games, it keeps... Uh, being released on new platforms over and over yeah. and new people keep finding it and uh, there is this and you keep adding new content too like you just keep adding new stuff and you, you well, know I'm as much of a fan as, as anybody else you know what yeah. I mean like it's true and honestly my wife still plays it I mean she's playing Bumba right now um, yeah. but she still will pick up Isaac and play the hell out of it and I'll end up just watching it and it's like how do you avoid like I'm watching it played, being played constantly, and I see things that would be, oh, well, wouldn't that be cool? Like, right wouldn't on. it be cool if I went that direction with that? Or wouldn't it be cool if that item did that? Or what kind of item would combo well with that? So it's, it's impossible to stop thinking about it. And for whatever reason, people are still playing it after nine years, you know? Like, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's insane. It's confusing almost to me. But um, it, it's like if, a people are, if people are into it and people want it, then I'm going to keep going. But I... I feel like at this point, you know, the Isaac prequel, uh, the Four Souls card game, which came out last year, and that yep. was also really fun to work on. Yep. And then um, Repentance, which will be out next year, which will be the final DLC for 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 Rebirth. Um, I'd like to put it down and work on other things. Like I'd really like to work on Eugenics, um, and that's my next project that I'm going to pick back up again. That is great. 
Are you, uh, you did, you've done something recently with Meat Boy as well, right? You had a, uh, I, did, I, did, I, don't, I, did, I don't think I played that one though. Was, was it the mobile version of Meat Boy and was it a running? I'm not sure. Um, I left Team Meat about four years ago and I'm, I'm not really keeping track of what they're doing, but I think they released a auto runner or something. Okay. Super Meat Boy Forever. Okay, but but Edmund's not involved in that. Uh, you, you make games, especially with Isaac, that are revealing about you and some of the uh, tougher things that you've gone through in your life. And I'm wondering if, and you've also revealed a lot about you through um, Indie Game, the movie, and I'm sure through lots of other interviews and discussions out there. Do you, you must have interesting correspondence and interesting connections with the people that play your titles and get to know you a little bit. Have you, have you, um, you know, been in contact with people that have sort of seen your success and your ability to, uh, you know, communicate some of these things from your past that were a little bit darker, um, and they look to you for a little guidance or a little help, or what's what's um, going on that way? I, I guess to some degree. I mean, I'll get I'll get some, I'll get the odd email where it's like, you know, I was going through a really tough time, but. It, you know, I was playing, I played Isaac, you know, a lot, a lot of people would just thank me for an outlet of escape, which is fine, you know, um, and there's sometimes where it's like this resonated with me in a personal way and I really appreciate it, which is super cool too. But I never, I never set out with like, my goal is never to, I don't even care if people pick up on what I'm putting down, you know, it's, it's mostly yeah. for me, it's, it, it makes it so it's a personal project. It makes me more invested in it. Um, it gives me a voice and to anybody else for the most part just comes off as strange, you know, people don't really take video games seriously, which is nice. Um, yeah. cause then I don't have people cycle analyzing me constantly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that must've changed though, after indie game, the movie though. I don't know. I mean, people are nice. Um, it is what it is. I mean, I put, I put it out there and if, if they want it, they can, they can pick it apart and figure it out. Um, but I'm just trying to be honest and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm an artist and that's the, the only thing that I can do that is true to myself is put a piece of me out there and, um, see what people do with it. And, uh, um, it's just what I do. Um, I can't help it. I love uh, it. If it helps, it helps. Great. If not, it's, it's whatever. I love it. How, how much has your life changed now that you are a veteran game maker? You're not a... Um, now I'm an old man. You're not a fresh kid just starting out, but you, you've had success and you, you've reached an audience and you've got people that uh, stream your game every single day. You know, like how much has your life changed or have you purposefully tried to sort of keep it the same? Well, no, it's, it's, it's been the same. I mean, um, I don't want it to change. Like my... The, what, the only thing that I have now is security and the security, the financial security that I have, I'm using to try to take risks and do weirder things. Like when, um, not many people even realize this now, but I'll, right after Super Meat Boy released, I started working on The Binding of Isaac and that was, that was my career suicide piece. You know, that was my, <laughs> I'm going to do something so not safe and so strange and so mechanically different. And I'm going to play with themes that people are going to just be turned off by. But I'm just going to lay it all out there and say this is really who I am because for the most part, Super Meat Boy was me playing it safe. Like I had invested a lot of money into it. I couldn't risk making a game about a naked child, you know, that's crying on shit all day. Like yeah. that couldn't be the thing that I banked on for my future. Um, so you know, I played it safe with Super Meat Boy, made it as nice as I could without taking any too too much too many compromises. Yeah. And um, after that, I I when I had that financial stability, the first thing I wanted to do was take a big risk. And that big risk was the Binding of Isaac. Um, I had no idea what people would thought. I, I was so certain that it would not do well. I sold it for five dollars, and I almost sold it to Adult Swim for just a sponsorship fee of of forty thousand wow. dollars. And like, and I was this close. And it was, I think, it was um, John Blow and Adam Saltzman who both told me, like, you should just put it on Steam. This is pretty good. And I'm like, ah, well, it's in Flash. Like, it doesn't really perform too well, and it's so odd. And I don't think people are gonna like it. But <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> I was wrong. Um, well, you know, when I play Binding of Isaac, I, I'm totally because I'm, you know, I've been playing games forever, and I, I feel like it's, um, it's got this wonderful connection to classics like Robotron and and uh, Smash TV, sure. which 
you can play those two games forever, forever and ever and ever. And Isaac taps into that. And there's all this incredible imagery and, and storytelling in there. But at its core, it's just a fun game to play and challenge yourself with. Yeah, for sure. Is, is that the kind of stuff that you play? Like, what do you play for your inspiration? Man, I don't know if I play for inspiration, but I, I think I get more inspiration from music and movies than mm. other video games. Certain games will inspire a mechanic. A lot of the times, I'll um, hear about an upcoming game, upcoming game, and somebody will describe it, and I'll think, "Wow, that sounds really, really cool." And I'll start thinking to myself, "Wow, with a co- with a core mechanic like that, you could do this, 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 and this." I just build out this imaginary game in my head, and then their game comes out, and it's absolutely nothing like they described. And I've got a I've got a game idea sitting in my lap. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, this is this is what I thought your game was, but it, well, your game wasn't that at all. So I can make this freely without feeling like I'm ripping you off. That's um, fantastic. But yeah, that for the most part, it's like that. Like a game mechanic will usually fall in my lap because I assume a mechanic is like this, and it's actually not. But when it comes to just general inspiration, music moves me towards you know being creative overall, and and um, movies as well. Awesome. I mean, you, I play Pokemon. I play Pokemon Go and, and Overwatch, man. I don't know if I could be inspired that much by those games, but they're great games, um, and I play them a lot. <laughs> that's cool. I mean, I'm glad to hear that games are also an escape for you because I know that a lot of people that make video games want nothing to do with them at the end yeah. of their day, right? They just want to turn it off and walk away from the screens. But it's encouraging that that uh, you still love the medium and. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, because so much of your work is is based on family and, and your history, and now you're a parent, and your wife has been involved with you this whole time, you know, in running your business. Are you starting to see it manifest in your kid a little bit? She, you have a daughter, right? Yeah, yeah, I have a daughter. She's four. Um, yeah, I don't know. So far, the only thing that's really happened since she's born is me feeling really guilty about working so much. And realizing like what's important and what's not, you know, yeah. and like being like, okay, well, I needed realistically, I need to take a step back from all the heavy lifting. I got really into the idea that in order for me to make a game, I need to be doing so much of the work, and I need to be working constantly to didn't work myself to death. Like that was part of part of the the appeal somehow to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's just this drive to continue to go move forward and and just I'm gonna just take carry the load and I'm going to see how much I can, I can carry. Um, that's called and, the, uh, the, the guilt of success. <laughs> and when you start something and you create something, you feel you, because you love it, it's a part of you going on. You never stop working. And I think everybody that I talk to, and even with what I did in my background, I worked too much and it's very easy to fall into that trap, isn't it? It's yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to not feel like that's your worth. That's all you're worth. Yeah. Um, but, you know, ever since she's been born, you, you kind of reprioritize it. Like, I've had situations where, I mean, I'm just going upstairs to my office to work. And she's like, why do you have to go to work? It's yeah. like, well, I don't. Like, I don't. I don't have to. So maybe I shouldn't right now. Yeah. You know, there, there's definitely a lot of that. So, like, if anything, it's just kind of inspired me to do things that are less isolating. Um, one of the reasons why I did the four souls was because I got to work with my wife and, uh, we got to work together. I mean, I really look forward to when she's older and then she can actually help me with this sort of stuff. Um, hopefully she'll be into it. <laughs> she, she might just completely hate video games altogether. Just be a total, total rebel and hate everything I like. I've got a but, daughter too. And, and I'm letting her kind of come to me with this stuff. I don't force it down her throat, but I've started to include her in the conversations I have, and, and yeah. every once in a while I record her audio about a game or something <laughs> like that, and I stick yeah, it into the awesome. videos. And it's it's super cool. It's nice to share that with people. But I, I have a question because so much of your work, especially on Isaac, was so personal. Did you hear from family members that started to see a little bit of what you were, were revealing, and did it help you with your relationships within your family? No. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Did it get worse? My, my, my relationships, like, well, number one, like right off, right off uh, the indie game, the movie um, Meat Boy era, um, the success that brought me up really showed me 
who my friends really were and the, the, you know, suddenly you've got extended family coming out of the woodwork, asking for money, asking for jobs, telling you right. about how they can't pay their bills. And it's like, you're the one that fucking called me a weirdo and sent me home because I worship the devil because I play magic, the gathering and D and D, you know, like yeah. suddenly, you know, you want to hang around me. So a lot of weirdness happened. Um, outside of that, I mean, my father That's fodder is, for a new game, by the way, <laughs> yeah, my, <laughs> my father is a preacher, um, uh, down South and, uh, um, my mom, I see her every once in a while. Um, they know, they know what's in the game. Um, they know what I'm talking about and they don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, it, it is what it is. I mean, they were, they were there. Uh, they know, they know what happened. Um, and, uh, yeah, they just don't talk about it. I mean, I, I, I don't think my mother knows what I'm working. I have to tell my mom and show her what, you know, what I'm working on to make her realize it. And then she still calls like meat boy meatball or, yeah. You know, I by blinding of Isaac or something, you know. Yeah. But uh but my my wife's families are pretty they're pretty into everything that I'm doing. <laughs> so it's you, nice. And I've got I've got I've got a, I've got a bunch of uh friends who are very cool too. Um um but yeah, we don't really I guess maybe my make my, my uh themes are a little too weird and personal to come up in conversation. Yeah. Well, that's what gives them so much resonance, man. That's what gives them so much value. Oh, we lost. Oh, I luck. You're back. Um, I, I'm curious if uh, there's. You're based in Santa Clara, California. Is there a, Jesus. is there a um, a community there of game makers? Is there an artistic sort of, uh, y you know, group that you guys all get together and and share ideas and stuff and maybe think of collaborating? There are. Um, UCSC is local to Santa Cruz, and um, it's the college campus here, and they have a big game design. I mean, John, John and Brenda Romero taught there for a few years, and a bunch Fantastic. of other indie developers. I think even now, a few indie developers um, that have, are semi-retired have uh, are teaching up there, um, and, I've, and I've done a few talks up there. Um, but for the most part, the social stuff is frightening to me. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't, uh, I didn't, it wasn't something that appealed to me before I had any success. And after having success, I feel like, um, too awkward and I am not going to live up to any expectations. And, uh, I'd rather just, you know, not, I hear you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm become a jaded old man, but, uh, I mean, I'm not just my social anxiety overall is not well, bringing me out. Edmund, <laughs> it's, uh, honest, honestly, your, frankness is so refreshing and and so you know cool to see you know you get you reveal a, a part of yourself that uh, you know sometimes the industry kind of glosses over and it's you know i've watched this industry evolve into such a manufactured uh pr driven yeah. machine and when you see somebody that that uh genuinely you know bleeds for this stuff and and is pouring their heart out like you do. It's it's incredibly inspiring, you know. And well, it's not, it's not just to the game people. It's not just to fans of games and the future game makers, but to any artist out there. It's wonderful. It's nice to have the ability to do it. And I mean, that's one thing I always used to say when I was more active in the community. Um, is you know we're artists and we have the ability to take risks and be honest. And you know, art is about being honest, but. Not a lot of people subscribe to that same thing. I mean, maybe I'm, I feel like such a hippie sometimes. Yep. I feel me, like I'm, I'm me too, pushing brother. something that's... <laughs> it's like, me too, man. I've, I've been doing it's, this it's forever, hard. and I feel the same as you that way. You know? it's, I think it's hard for people, especially in this industry, um, where they like to crunch numbers, yep. to not look at those numbers and be like, well, I know if I say this, more people will like me. Yeah. Uh, I know if I say... And if more people like me, then more people are going to... I mean, I've heard people straight up behind the scenes talk about, even though they don't believe in X, Y, Z, let's frame this and let's include this and let's do this just to get this market of people. And it's just like, I just don't, like yeah. I understand what you're talking about, but I know you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. And it's kind of disgusting. And it's one of the reasons why I've kind of backed out um, from, from the spotlight when it comes to just being, in the click, the indie, indie kid click, you know, yeah. it's, it's, I, I, I'm sure I've got a lot to say as much as anybody else. But the thing is, is I'm going to say it through my games and I'm going to try not to stand out there on the corner on my soapbox and, and talk about 
X, Y, Z. I'm just going to do it with my, my work because that's, that's the ability that I have. Like I'm not a public speaker, you know, I make video games and, yeah. uh, I think I wish more people would do that. It's just such a weird, it's a business. And with business come lies. It's like over here, you got business and lies and then you've got art and honesty. And then they go, it's like, where do you compromise? Like where, where on the spectrum are you going to lean? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to be tainted by the business side of things because I, I have to still think about how, I'm, how am I going to sell this, especially if I'm working with somebody else who doesn't have any money. Yeah. And um, I got to think about that. I can't, I can't just make the most risky, you know, even though I have inside, I have this urge to just like, I'm just going to drive this one into the ground, but I'm going to make this really honest, cool art project that a handful of people are going to like it most. But I'm always working with somebody else who doesn't have money and it's like, well... I don't want to take a big risk for them, but eventually I'll get there. I think, I think eventually I'll, I'll end up, you know, taking those big risks and, uh, doing exactly what I want, but you can't, it's, I can see how difficult it is to not be tainted by that. Well, because- it's, a, it's a really interesting world that we live in, right? Cause the, the, the things that are so fun and inspiring and, and, uh, provide so much escapism for us are created by these giant public organizations, these giant public companies that mm-hmm. have to get return on investment and their shareholders come first. And yet we line up for the star Wars movies and the superhero movies and, and, uh, you know, games like overwatch and, uh, it, it is our art. And so the, the, the risk taking that you do is appreciated. It really is brother. Oh, well, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So Legend of Bumbo is out. It's out right now. It's coming to other machines. It's out on the PC, and you can play it on the Mac today, right? Not Mac yet. Not no, Mac, okay. Because Apple you know, is doing its Apple stuff. Uh, yes, So, but it's on PC. <laughs> uh, and yeah, then it's, it's on Steam. It's on Steam right now on PC. Is it going to come to um, mobile? Yep, it'll eventually come to mobile probably early next year. Um, and we're, we're working on getting another. We're nailing down another publisher for a new publisher, uh, for switch for sure. Cool. Um, and at this point, I mean, I, I could say after a week out of just looking at the sales figures after one week, it for sure will get a DLC at some point next year for Unreal. sure. Awesome. Um, where is uh, the best place to play the binding of Isaac? What platform do you enjoy the most? Um, I watch it being played on PlayStation the most, but that's probably the least when it comes to the fan base. Um, I think uh, people really love playing it on the switch. Um, it's hard to go wrong with a mobile version that you could also put on your television. Um, but I mean, I'm going to say steam. (laughs) All right. right. I mean, if you want, if you want the, you know, the fastest updates and the most support and all the little bells and whistles, like being able to mod the game and all that sort of stuff too, steam is where you want to be. Very cool. And, and, uh, lastly, tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. Like what's next for you? Apart from being uh, a good dad and spending lots of time with your daughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm definitely doing that. Um, that is high, that's high on my list. Um, I, uh, so this, I mean, this week we're working on improving um, Bumbo. Um, and then I hope to do a little mini update with some extra content by New Year. Um, and I will be starting to work on eugenics again with Tyler Glale. Um, and that'll be probably a one or two year project. And at some point next year, I think we're going to do a four souls expansion. Um, and maybe another little game, maybe a physical game again. I'd like to do more physical stuff. Um, it, it, it's much more relaxing. Um, I, it's very easy. It's very fun. And I get to make it with my family. So that's cool. And friends. So and I know I, you like I, things I, on your I, shelf too. You like the physical. I do. I like stuff, as you can see by the garbage all in my in the background of my office. This is a, uh, this is post Bumbo. There used to be cardboard everywhere, and now it's just like you're, boxes that you're, are. You're you're with family here. Everywhere. We like stuff at EP as well. <laughs> it's it's yeah, nice I, to have. I the can't little... deny. I like. I love stuff. I absolutely <laughs> love stuff. I'm a collector of many odd things. <laughs> That's awesome. Ed McMillan, it is awesome to have you on EP, and uh, best of luck with The Legend of Bumbo, and uh, please keep making your art and entertaining all of us, okay, my friend? Oh, I can't stop. I can't. (laughs) If I stop, I die. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, you guys, we are going to move on now. We've got a review of the latest Pokemon game.
Nintendo's got one last big end of the year title for us to take a look at for Nintendo Switch. It is Pokemon Sword and Shield. I've been looking forward to this game ever since the first trailers dropped and it kind of promised this idea of an open world Zelda Breath of the Wild-esque Pokemon experience and coupled with that is the more kind of traditional Pokemon experience. This isn't going to shock you. And to some degree, you know, I was I have to say that I was a little disappointed that this didn't shake up the formula even more. I think this is going to make Pokemon fans quite happy because there's a bunch of new Pokemon characters to catch and play with and there's new mechanics that are fun like the Dynamax battles in the stadium. <laughs> And, you know, the characters are pretty cool. There's kind of a British vibe to the environment of Galar, which is the new setting of Pokemon Sword and Shield, and it's charming. Graphics are pretty damn solid. There's some aliasing for sure, but I'm not gonna be one of those people on the internet that's freaking out about whatever Game Freak promised and whatever has been delivered. It looks pretty damn good to my eyes. It maybe doesn't look as pop off the screen as the Let's Go games did, but the Let's Go games were much smaller Pokemon experiences made, I think, to just get people in the door and get people kind of addicted to collecting and also use the pokeball plus peripheral which is also you can use that in certain cases with this game as well this is a meteor game there's lots and lots of pokemon to catch and there's lots of pokemon to evolve there's a tremendous amount of customization you can outfit your character in all kinds of different outfits and they've got different costumes when they're getting into the stadium battles which is a lot of fun and you unlock lots of little gifts along the way and you earn tons of currency that you can spend on candies and berries and all kinds of health power-ups and different kinds of pokeballs to catch bigger and bigger pokemon along the way there's also mini games and things at one point i was having to herd a bunch of sheep to progress through these different pokey trainer challenges which was fun different layers of collectability that are rampant in this game and all have been a big part of the joy that people have with pokemon games over the years There is this wild open area where you can run around and you can see the Pokemon running everywhere and you can decide whether you're going to go and battle them or not. There's actually an ability for you to connect with different people and go on raid battles together, which is really cool. And it's very easy to do that, which I appreciate it as well. And there's also an opportunity for you to test out your Dynamax abilities and grow your Pokemon and battle these other big, huge sort of Godzilla-sized Poke creatures, which is great. <laughs> All of that is fun, and it's all addictive series of loops. I chose Score Bunny. I chose a fire character. I tend to lean in that direction, and I was very happy with my choice. He was kind of a badass. I didn't have any real trouble sort of battling anybody throughout the game. And that was you know, one of my issues with the title is that it's still a little hand even though there are quality of life things like the ability to fast travel with a flying taxi you can also get on a bike and ride around which was a lot of fun I just found that you know for the first several hours at least it was really kind of easy to level up and just defeat everybody and rarely did I feel a challenge from either the Pokemon experts that I was battling or the wild Pokemon that I would encounter <laughs> I did, however, feel that compulsion and that hook to stay in this world, and I think that is the core win of the Pokemon games in general. I also feel like this is the beginning of what Pokemon is gonna be, and it's almost like the developers at the Pokemon Company and Game Freak just said, look, we've got some new stuff to throw in here, but we're not gonna like overturn the apple cart and start fresh, and like we're not gonna shock everybody with what we're doing here with this game. We're keeping the basics and the fundamental stuff as part of the game design and the core kind of attraction of this title, and this is what Pokemon games will look like and improve on from here on out. We've had so many years of 2D-based Pokemon games or rudimentary 3D designed portable games, and we have definitely gone into a new era of great looking Pokemon experience. I think that this is still a better game to play in portable mode, as cool as it is to throw it up on the big screen and how innovative it is. 
I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next from this, and I still have lots to play in this game as well. It's one of these titles where there's a tremendous amount of experimentation. I think it's a lot of fun, and I think it hits all of the quadrants that you want out of a Pokemon experience. Maybe it doesn't have the most robust roster. Maybe, you know, a lot of the Pokemon that are introduced in this aren't as memorable as the launch creatures like my beloved Score Bunny. I still think that this is a charming and very fulfilling experience, and it's hard not to recommend this title for you Pokemaniacs out there. I'm going to give Pokemon Shield from Pokemon Sword and Shield an 8.5 out of 10. We went a little bit long with our interview with Edmund McMillan, and I'm seeing all of your nice comments over there. 10 out of 10 for the interview. Uh, I, it's, it's streaming fast, you guys. But thank you very much for being here. Danny Sullivan and the VR Grid and Nintendo Boy 17, uh, Mondo Blasto Zero, uh, Miss Hojat. Uh, I think that's who said it was a 10 out of 10 interview. Uh, Rock Yass said great interview. VR Grid said that was great. Very fun talking with Ed. I, I love how... Uh, just down to earth and accessible and honest and real he is. And it's uh, honestly, it's something that I've noticed people, I got an email today, I can't tell you guys about it, but it was ridiculous. And I almost don't want to say this on, on air, but uh, it's it, honestly, it really underlines how policed conversations around games are now. You know, this I, I used to have carte blanche access to any developer anywhere. People would just let us in and we'd have a great conversation and we'd get them to do silly, crazy stunts and we'd add CG in and everybody trusted us. And now everybody's just so worried about what they're going to say and if they can say it and if they can, you know, they're going to piss off the publisher or whatever. And the, the business has to stop. It has to stop that. It has to remember that it's an art form first and that it's made by human beings. You know, that's what EP is all about. We get to the people that make these things and we let them speak their mind in an honest way. That's what I want to do. That's what I've always wanted to do with this show. And it's frustrating that the video game industry wants to clamp it and clench it and just do the talking points and just sell the games and hype, 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 hype. That's not doing anybody any good. All of you people that cover, that, that love video games and watch this stuff all the time, you see that and you see the inauthenticity and you question everything and you're suspicious of, of uh, these bullet points on a regular basis. And uh, if people just spoke their mind and talked to us about what they're trying to do and, and we're given that platform and that trust from the audience as well, it would be better. You know, we don't question every filmmaker about... Uh, you know, some of the creative choices that they're putting into their movies, we just accept that they're trying some things, you know? And I feel like with video games, we need a little bit more of that too. And that honestly, it starts with the marketing departments and the PR companies that are uh, working with these teams and these companies. They have to let them speak their mind and they have to give them a little bit more freedom. That's what I'm hoping for. I don't know if it's gonna change, um, especially as we get more and more people that just, uh, you know, like to report on secondhand information, read somebody else's work on a website and. And, uh, and just pontificate on that. Anyways, so off the soapbox, I've got one last review for you. We've got time for one more. This, I finished up the, the second season of Jack Ryan. Let's take a look at that. Okay, here we go, all teams ready. I got to finish my binge watching of Jack Ryan season two. It's only eight episodes, so they actually fly by pretty quickly, but here I am in Japan covering a Tom Clancy event, the big Pro League finals for Rainbow Six Siege right here, and I finished off a Tom Clancy series that I was actually really looking forward to. I enjoyed Jack Ryan season one quite a bit more than I thought that I would. I always thought that John Krasinski was a bit of an odd casting choice to be this leading man spy, you know, spy with with a bit of an action edge, but there was an element there that kind of made sense because this was a guy that got dragged into action kind of against his own desire. And honestly, Jack Ryan has been an interesting character in fiction for a long time. I was a fan of the Harrison Ford Jack Ryan movies. I still like The Hunt for Red October with Alec Baldwin. He was a great Jack Ryan as well. So I gave season one a chance and I ended up liking it quite a bit, mostly because they honored that idea of Jack Ryan being this studious, highly intelligent analyst that got dragged into a combat kind of role. And he was capable and he handled himself quite well. In season two, I liked this show less and less, and at the end I ended up just absolutely hating it. I can't really talk about it 
and why I don't like it anymore and why I feel like this show has completely jumped the shark without spoiling a little bit. But suffice to say, this idea of a uh, an intelligent, tactically minded, reserved agent is completely thrown to the side and we get a Jack Ryan that is... I mean, he it's like he's James Bond. And we get comic book style super villains that are basically twirling their mustaches or their big bushy beards in this case. And the super villain is the president of Venezuela. And I just thought it was ridiculous. At one point, he kills somebody very close to him in the most atrocious and despicable way you can imagine. He's got a prisoner of war camp. He's got a dungeon in his palace. And it's just all so cartoonish and just over the top. And the other thing is John Hugenlocker, who was terrific in the first season, he played this kind of deadpan military specialist that got connected with Wendell Pierce and John Krasinski's characters and kind of trained them and got them ready for the combat and the conflict that they faced in the first season. Good performer. And he's got some good stuff in season two as well, but they end up, and this is a spoiler, they end up killing the character and in, in such a ridiculous John Wayne over the top way that it, it was just abysmal. I just thought it was such a joke. Right, go! There is this female presidential candidate that's going up against the evil president. Her name is Gloria Binalde, played by Christina Umana. And I just thought, man, this would have been a way cooler show if they had focused on her story. And Jack Ryan and Jim Greer, Wendell Pierce and John Krasinski had just been kind of little supporting characters that popped up. And, you know, they were trying to deal with all of the intrigue and, and the spy stuff, but in a, in a more of a supporting way. And it would have added a whole different dynamic to this story, and they could have grounded it. Instead, we have this ridiculous, and this is major spoilers, but we have this ridiculous ending sequence where it's our two leads. It's Wendell Pierce and John Krasinski and Mike Kelly as well, who is slumming it after his terrific work on House of Cards. They're all packing machine guns, and they've got a bunch of other military guys with them, and they commandeer a U.S. military chopper, and they land on the roof of the presidential palace in Caracas and they basically have a firefight all the way through this palace and it's just so it's it's so like ripped out of the James Bond movies and it's just so silly I mean it's so over the top and and obnoxious and you you wouldn't be able to fly and land on a presidential palace in the middle of a, a bustling city while you're you know the president is still in office and he's got army and military all around him they would have some ability to knock out a chopper coming towards the palace to land on it but they they don't and somehow during the eve of a big election they're able to sneak into the palace and just wipe out the entire venezuelan army that's inside of the palace and then eventually get to the bad guy and it was just so just ridiculous and I also it started to bug me the sort of grit and the furrowed brow and, and the determination that Jack Ryan has in the show and the fact that his hair is always perfect and his face looks like it was expertly smudged by the makeup people just to give him enough little dirt on there but his clothes are perfect and he's just like he's got a I mean it's like he's uh, he's like one of the J Crew models that the other models said, man, you look badass. You're ready for your scene. It's just so pathetic. I hate the show. I hated it. It was terrible. And I was so disappointed because it started off pretty strong. So I'm giving season two of Jack Ryan a four out of 10. And I'll tell you what, I'm done. I'm not coming back for season three. I'm over it. Man, I was so disappointed by Jack Ryan. I started out strong. I think I gave the first three episodes that I had watched like an eight. And I was like, yeah, I'm getting into this. And then it just turned into terrible television. It's just so cheeseball. And uh, I don't know. Like, why do you cast? Um, what's his name again? John uh, Krasinski. Why do you why do you cast? Yeah. Why do you cast him as your hero? Who's supposed to be this sort of anti-hero kind of, you know, sly underdog. But, you know, he's he's secretly he's he's got the action chops. Why do you cast a guy like that and then turn him into Rambo? Why do you do that? That's just stupid. Terrible show. 
Uh, anyways, enough ranting from me today. It was an awesome episode. Thanks again to um, Ed McM Edmund McMillan for coming on EP Live today with us. You were wonderful. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Game Love and The Wren and uh, Josue uh, Martinez and uh, Abby Jamison and Finite Joy. Didn't have time for Let's Play and Chat today, but uh, we probably will have some time for Let's Play and Chat on Friday. My guest is uh, Lino De, De, uh, De, Sil De Salvo. Lino DeSalvo, I've never met him. Uh, he's coming on. He's going to talk to us about uh, the animation world. He's the director of the new Playmobil movie, and he is uh, he was the supervising animator on Frozen. He's worked on lots of stuff. He's got tons of great experience and lots of stories for us. Really looking forward to that. Uh, show starts a little bit earlier on Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please come on down to the uh, VFS Cafe at 390 West Hastings if you're in Vancouver and you want to learn out, uh, learn anything about the animation world or uh, uh, watch us right here on the stream. We'll see you in a couple of days. We'll have new content for you tomorrow, of course. Thanks for watching, everybody, and play forever.